And good morning. Welcome to Mayflower Church, where we believe no matter who you are or where you are, even if you don't know where you are, on life's journey, you are welcome here. Text comes from comes from Isaiah, uh, Israel's most famous uh, and powerful prophet. This is the eleventh chapter of verses one through ten. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. Here ends this reading inspired by God. May God grant to us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Robin said it last week, and I will repeat it today. Most of you have heard these texts from Isaiah. They are so familiar that you have parts of them memorized, and this morning's scripture is no different. I mean, we might get the animals mixed up a little. Lions and tigers and bears. Oh, wait, no tigers. Does the wolf live with the lamb, or is it the lion? And what kind of snake is the baby playing with? A viper? A rattlesnake? Well... Whatever, a little child shall lead them, yada, yada, yada. Everybody's playing together nicely in the sandbox. The end. The text is traditionally understood as a foretelling of Jesus, a messianic prophecy. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The root of Jesse sometimes need a bit of explanation. Jesse is the father of King David, the most celebrated king of Israel. The gospel written by Matthew spends almost the entire first chapter explaining how we get from Abraham to David to Jesus. Let's just say it's not exactly a straight line, but Matthew's audience needed to know that Jesus was part of the family. Interpretation and application typically stops there with Isaiah supposedly talking about how great Jesus will be and how everything will be made right under his kingship, which ultimately leaves us in a really awkward place, considering that Jesus came and went without any of the rest of the prophecy coming to pass. There is no peace. There is no security. This interpretation of Isaiah leaves us perpetually singing, Somewhere over the rainbow. I mean, even if things haven't gotten worse, they are still just as bad. But this observation is usually dismissed by the argument that all of our dreams really will come true with the second coming of Jesus. Ditch the manger scene in Silent Night, bring on the four horsemen in the apocalypse. But as Fred Craddock once said, People are obsessed with the second coming because they're disappointed in the first one. 
It is also highly convenient for us to put all of our eggs in the Jesus basket because then we aren't on the hook for bringing about Isaiah's vision of peace. To be fair, it sounds rather messy. What exactly happens when the lamb and the kid and the calf get a dinner invitation from the leopard and the lion? Perhaps the lion, after opening the evite, emails the lion back. Excuse me, Mr. Lion, I mean, I don't want to seem rude or ungrateful, but may I ask exactly who, I mean what, is on the menu? And then there's the whole snake and baby thing. No. Which parent would like to volunteer their kid for the first test run? Go on, little one, it'll be fine, but mama's gonna stay back behind the glass. The circumstances under which Isaiah wrote were not great. The 8th century was not a good one for the people of Israel. Some of them are in exile and the rest live under Assyrian occupation. Life was short and life was violent. A few chapters before this one, the prophet speaks of the situation as if God's hand is turned against the people. This is how it felt. They feel abandoned by God. This is why the Davidic family tree is described not as a tree, but as a stump, cut off, dead, leafless, and lifeless. Things are looking down. The people have lost hope. They need a pep talk. So Isaiah steps into the pulpit, clears his throat, and adjusts the mic. He gives them a vision, a hope for the future, something to look forward to. Isaiah gives them a change of scenery, one of peace and security, things they haven't known for a long time. The vision, though, isn't exactly something that can be turned into a scene from Braveheart. It starts with a, a shoot, which is not quite the sword-wielding warrior one might assume will be needed to bring Israel out of occupation. The Israelites were looking for a battle-tested, muscled-up champion, much like Oklahoma Democrats are looking for a viable gubernatorial candidate. <laughs> Optimism is low. When Isaiah describes the kind of leader it will take to usher in salvation, it is important to note that they are gifts of the spirit, wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, knowledge and fear of the Lord, which might also be called the spirit of humility. He does not list West Point graduate, 10 years of military experience with a wife and 2.5 children as qualifications. Even if Isaiah expects a Messiah, it is not a business-as-usual savior who returns violence for violence. Don't forget, just last week, the church's curriculum reminded us that we are to beat our swords into plowshares and study war no more. Isaiah was serious about that. This vision of peace is different than expected. Salvation will not fly in on the wings of a drone. The revolution will not be televised. Isaiah goes on to describe poetic tranquility that seems to do nothing to encourage resistance. I wonder if it sounded as bland to Isaiah's audience as it does to us. I mean, honestly, this is partly why we are at best indifferent to this scripture reading. That's cute, Isaiah, this baby goats with leopards, cows and bears, children and poisonous snakes. Isaiah had no idea that his prophecy would be molded into a precious moments figurine, a lion and lamb with dewdrop eyes and blonde curls snuggled up together, yours for just $24.99. We live in serious times, and we need serious words. After all, another vision has been cast, this one quite a bit different from a scene of predators and prey living in harmony. It draws from the oft-worshipped book, Atlas Shrugged, and takes its cues from the stock market. The promised Messiah comes bearing unchecked capitalism and is marked by the 
spirit of every man for himself. The wolves of Wall Street shall eat with the one percent. The largest tax cut shall be given to the highest income households. Corporations shall keep their workforce and factories in America or risk being slapped with billions of dollars in tax breaks. <laughs> A wall shall be built to keep out the other. Earlier this year, the president-elect promised to build a great, great wall on our southern border and have Mexico pay for that wall. This is his version of peace and security. Keep those people out. It's coming from more than Mexico, he declared. It's coming from all over South and Latin America. It's coming from probably, probably from the Middle East. But we don't know because we have no protection and we have no competence. We don't know what's happening. It's got to stop and it's got to stop fast. Proposals from the administration elect have included a ban on Muslims entering the country, a moratorium on accepting Syrian refugees, and a vow of extreme vetting of would-be immigrants. And let's not forget about the comparison of refugees to a bowl of Skittles as if humans are candy. The oil and gas industry shall cozy up to the federal government and be allowed unrestricted drilling into the earth to drain it of every last drop of oil. Lands that have been protected and set aside for public use shall be turned over to private interests. There shall be pipeline crossing the country from Alaska to Florida, over the river, under the river, and ultimately into the river. Because the only certainties in life are death, taxes, and oil spills. But more importantly, there shall be profit. This is the vision, except not for the church. We have Isaiah. We have this upside down, inside out, backwards, unexpected prophecy, lions and lambs, cows and bears. It seems to have been domesticated, tamed, reduced to a watercolor, but these verses articulate a deep and persistent human hope for justice and peace. There is nothing tame about it. It is a fierce scrambling for abundant life. It's easier to hear if you update some of the language. If a wolf can lie down with a lamb, then maybe a Republican can work with a Democrat. Mayflower Church shall conspire with OG&E to get solar panels on the roofs of every church in Oklahoma County. The city council members of Oklahoma City shall stand with panhandlers in the median until they earn their council member salary. Clergy shall lie down on the steps of the state capitol until the death penalty is repealed. Sally Kern shall work with LGBTQ advocates to ban conversion therapy. The title of their legislation shall be called Prevention of Childhood Endangerment. Representative John Bennett shall sponsor an interim study on white supremacy and the radicalization of young white Christian males. Then he shall host a fundraiser for the Islamic Society of Greater Oklahoma City. The oil and gas industry shall consult indigenous tribes so that nothing will hurt or destroy the holy mountains, the sacred plains, or the life-giving water that have been theirs since the beginning. The military-industrial complex shall partner with Peace Corps and build a reputation for constructing sturdy homes and reliable infrastructure instead of guns and tanks. Oklahoma Republicans and Democrats shall work together to fully fund public education and provide statewide health care coverage. White Americans shall apologize to black Americans for the original sin of slavery and the continuation of white privilege. It's a start. Now, when shall it come to pass? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? If we're waiting on a Messiah, it could be a while. 
But I'm convinced that's not what we're supposed to do. The gifts of the Spirit are available to all of us, and Jesus never said anything about waiting for his encore appearance. Rather, he pours out the Spirit onto his followers and says, Go and do likewise. And after that, it was the Apostle Paul who gave us an explicit timeline. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day things begin to change. And people have made this claim before. People we describe as having gifts of the Spirit, wisdom, knowledge, and humility. Clara Limlick, perhaps you might need to look her up, Clara Limlick prophesied that factory owners shall care for garment workers today. Justice for the working poor brought to you by a 19-year-old woman. Rosa Parks, who needs no introduction, Rosa Parks prophesied that black people shall sit with white people at the front of the bus today. The Sioux of Standing Rock are right now prophesying that oil companies shall come to the table to negotiate today. So what will be said of us? What are we prophesying today? Of life on the holy mountain, Robin asked last week, can you see it? Can you see it? Perhaps we need to read the curriculum again But for the first time, this is why we dust off Isaiah during the dark days of Advent, to hear the Spirit of the Lord reminding us to quit feeling sorry for ourselves, that we are instruments of peace and justice. We are reminded to to spark our imagination, to call us to action, to give us permission to hope, given all of the other visions that are trying to cloud the future. It is so important we read Isaiah and take his prophecy seriously. The weak need to be able to hope that they will not be consumed by the powerful. The strong, and perhaps this is the more difficult type of hope, the strong need to be able to hope that they do not need to consume another in order to prosper. This is the world we are working for. We aren't waiting on anyone. Today is the day of salvation. We know what to look for. We have the vision. Amen.